book of Judges chapter number one, and we're, I'm sorry, I said Judges one. Uh, we advanced beyond that, not at a very alarming rate, however, but we did make it. I want you to be in Judges 18, like I said originally, all right? Judges chapter 18, and uh, we are going to continue to look at uh, how that idolatry became an issue uh, within the nation of Israel. And there are some times when we, I think, look at the Old Testament and we think, well, yeah, it really doesn't have a whole lot for me. I mean, yeah, okay, so uh, so-and-so did this, and yeah, that's great, and, and uh, they fell down and worshipped a golden calf. Well, who'd be dumb enough to make a golden calf? And so, yeah, well, that's a great message, preacher. Thank you. And uh, we, we head on our separate ways. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4 reminds us that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Uh, there are lessons to be able to be learned. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about the Israelites and uh, the pattern that they set that we are not to follow. One of those things that they unfortunately did that we are not to follow is involve themselves in idolatry. We are going to continue looking into Judges 18 at changing the incorruptible into the corruptible. It's a phrase that is taken out of Romans chapter number 1 that describes what an unsaved person would do. They would take the, uh, change the image of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and four-footed beasts and so forth. I want to ask this question tonight as we begin this section of Scripture that is kind of a puzzling section in some ways. Can you honestly say that God is first in your life? That's the real heart of the matter. And that's what we begin to address. I don't see that we necessarily are falling down and worshiping an image, though there are some, no doubt, within this country who do exactly that. Certainly we see it in other countries where Eastern religions are uh, more predominant. But there are a lot of things in our culture that have become idolatrous in many ways. Our jobs have taken over in many ways. Um, we are an exhausted people. As a culture, and I don't say that because of our, our scenario tonight, but as a culture, we are an exhausted people. We push, we strive, we do all of this. For what end? <laughs> uh, happiness? More money? You get a raise, what happens? <laughs> you spend it. It's not that your savings is just that much better. Uh, things we, we just adjust, and, and we're, we're constantly pushing. I had a thought as we were singing today, I, and I wonder, is it possible that technology has become a god? It's interesting, there is a, uh, some statistics that are out. I, Time Magazine put this out in uh, 2015. It said that on average, and that is a, a key phrase, uh, on average, people in the United States check their phones 46 times per day. That's on average. This is a, a statistic that someone else has done. Um, but that number varies depending on users' age group. Uh, those between ages 18 and 24 look at their phones most often with an average of 74 checks per day. Some of you are looking at it now. <laughs> Americans in the age of 25 to 34 look at their devices 50 times a day, and those between 35 and 44 do so 35 times a day, and those above that don't even know they have a phone, okay? <laughs> that's not part of the statistic, but I would say that's probably the, the reality of it. For what end? Um, to see if someone wants to talk to you? It's one thing when it goes off, but how many times do we check it just to see what's going on? Uh, again, I would ask the question, to what end? Um, what are we hoping to achieve by this? Some sort of self-gratification that somebody wanted to talk to me today. <laughs> um, 
Generally, my phone goes off and it's like, oh, okay, uh, somebody wants to talk to me, okay, and then depending on what number it is, oh, and they want to call me into work, uh, okay, uh, I mean, whatever it might be. Um, my point is that it's, it's very interesting to me to take a look at things like, I'm not saying that's wrong to check your phone, you know, don't get this into a, a ridiculous extreme that uh, is certainly not at all uh, my intent. But while we can criticize the Israelites for a number of things, I wonder often if we're not guilty of the exact same things. And what is it that we are pursuing? The Bible teaches us in Matthew chapter 6 that above all else, we're to seek the kingdom of God. Above everything. We seek the kingdom of God in addition to a lot of other things. And think that we can spend equal time on, on all of those things. And the reality is that simply is not the case. The message of Judges chapter 18 is a continuation from that of chapter 17, and it further illustrates the rebellion of Israel in the matter of idolatry. We'll see another uh, major section beginning in chapter 19 that will continue on through the end of the chapter that is going to be a section that centers on immorality, and, and the, the things that are, will take place are jaw-dropping. This is what happens when, as we've entitled this entire series, when God's truth no longer reigns. It'll happen in an individual, it can happen in a corporate church, it can happen uh, to a family, it can happen in a lot of things. Where is God's truth when it all comes down to it? We describe the lesson in chapter 17 as being a reversal of morals. What happens when man determines to be uh, right what God says to be wrong? The account in Judges 17 centered on an individual by the name of Micah, who, as you may recall, stole 1,100 shekels of silver from his mother. He heard the curse that she pronounced upon the thief, and so he acknowledged and confessed that he's the one who stole the silver. She then wishes God's blessing now that she knows that it's his son, her son, and uh, Kind of interesting as well. Uh, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Uh, no, you still stole. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a different scent of that different idea of things. Well, nonetheless, he restored the money to his mother. His mother hired a silversmith who made a molten image as well as a carved image that was placed in the house of Micah. And in Micah's house, he had an ephod, a teraphim, which would be the family idols. He took and consecrated one of his sons to become priest. Well, then eventually, an unnamed young man from the tribe of Levi happened to be sojourning in Mount Ephraim, where Micah lived. And Micah said, well, why are you here? And he explained, I'm looking for a place to stay. And he said, well, here, why don't you come be here, and you can dwell with me, and, and you can be my priest. I'll pay you, and, and I'll do all of this, and, and I'll provide for you. And wow, man, what a great opportunity. And, and then in the all end of it, he says, and now I know that God's hand is going to be on me. I got my own priest. I have got the key to success. I've got my good luck charm. Uh, I don't mean it irreverently, but you know, sometimes that's how we view God. Um, God, I need a good day, so I'm just going to pray that you give me a good day. Good day equals no problems. That's not how God defines good days, by the way. God defines good days as probably a lot of adversity to make you more like him. Okay, God, I don't want a good day. <laughs> Okay, uh, I want to, I, I don't know what I want, Lord. <laughs> okay, I know what I'm supposed to want, but hey, Lord, I don't want that. Okay, uh, the challengers are there. Well, we saw five characteristics of what I termed as a reversal of morals. What happens when this takes place? These are things we already saw last week. Number one, wrong is regarded as being right. Oh, you stole from me. Oh, bless you, son, my son. <laughs> Wrong is regarded as right. Number two, wrong deeds are justified by good intentions. Um, you know, this is what I was going to do. And, and you know, I, I, I was giving you this money so that, so that we could uh, give this to the Lord. We're going to make these images and dedicate them to the Lord. No. <laughs> that's in direct defiance to what God said. Number three, wrong becomes the pursued action. That's very clearly what happens in that particular chapter. Right becomes subject to individual opinion. We begin to look at it and see, well, uh, you know, hey, uh, you can be my priest. Oh, okay. Well, that was never something God instituted. God's blessing, number five, is improperly measured. Now that I got this priest, I, the Lord's going to do me good, is verse number 13. 
state. This is what's going to happen. We use these same things, and this is what's happened in America. We have taken and we have turned things upside down. What God says is wrong, we've come along and said, no, that's right. And we've come along and said, well, it doesn't matter what you're doing, as long as your heart's okay, then it's fine. No, it's not. We've come along and, and have pursued the wrong direction for our lives. We've come along and said, well, what's right for you may not be right for me, but you know, as long as you think it's right, then go right ahead. God's standard of absolute right and wrong has been completely done away with, and we say, well, no, it's just relative. It's relative to you, it's relative to your circumstances. I want to hire those people, by the way, to do work at my house. I agree to pay them, now pay you $10 an hour to do all these projects in my house. When it comes time to pay, I'm just going to pay you $10. Why? Well, because that's what I think is right. And evidently you think that's okay to say that truth is relative. Uh, I can get a lot done. It only cost me 10 bucks. Okay? They're not going to have the same idea that truth is relative at that point in time. Okay? Uh, and uh, we find that to be true all throughout things. God's blessing, we, we improperly measure this. We, uh, so Timothy was told from those who think that gain is godliness, withdraw yourself from them. As long as I'm getting more, then that must mean God's in this. More money, God's blessing. More people in the church, God's blessing. I've seen a lot of churches that are growing, and they're far from what I would classify even as a church. They're growing. doesn't mean God's blessing is there. Don't equate prosperity with success. Well, now it continues on into chapter number 18, and we want to begin by the second of the four uses of the phrase, and there's those days there was no king in Israel. In those days, the Bible says, the tribe of the Danites sought an inheritance to dwell in, for under that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. The author of Judges is obviously writing during a time when there was a king, and he's reflecting back to a period of time when Israel had no king. Unfortunately, they chose to reject God as their king, and they chose to do then whatever they wanted to do. And so we don't know exactly when these events occurred. But again, the purpose of the closing narrative here in the book of Judges is not chronological. It's designed to show this is what's going to happen when you turn your back on the truth of God's word. Nothing good comes out of those things. So let's begin by looking at the need for expansion. Here's the tribe of Dan. And Dan comes along and says, well, you know what? We need more room. Well, you go back, and I'm not going to have us turn to all of the passages. You can jot some of these down. But Dan was given sufficient territory in Joshua chapter number 19. You read about it, verses 44 through 40. And they had about, I think it was probably around 10 cities or so that are given to them. It's just an approximate. There was plenty of room for Dan. Plenty of room. The problem is not that Joshua did not give them sufficient land. The problem is what Dan did with the land that Joshua gave them. You recall that each of the nations were told after the initial conquest, now you go back and take your territory and, and finish the deed, so to speak. And completely drive out the inhabitants of the land. Completely eliminate them so that you don't end up falling into their idolatry. Dan's territory is going to be uh, now down in the southern portion. It would be west of uh, Judah towards the Mediterranean Sea. You would have uh, uh, Benjamin and Ephraim are going to be up kind of in the northern section of it, but it's, it's down in the, the further south part. And they had plenty of territory to be able to do things well. The problem they encountered was not because Joshua gave them insufficient land and cities. The problem is that they did not conquer the land that God gave them. You remember in Judges chapter 1, all of the really sad account of the nations that didn't do? They just put them to tribute. They said, well, you know, it's okay. We, we can go ahead and live with them. Oh, no, they'll be all right. We'll, we'll just, I mean, what's the point in killing them? I mean, that's kind of heartless. It's people. We might as well kill them. Let's make money on them. Well, you know, we want to be sure that we're in control, but let's make some money on these people. And that's what they did. 
I want you to notice, and I've got this on the slide, Judges chapter 1, verse number 34. Notice what happened. The Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. The Amorites <laughs> forced the inhabitants of the tribe of Dan to live on the mountain. Couldn't come down into the valley. Well, they needed to be able to come down into the valley. So they cramped them all into this area. And this is now why all of a sudden Dan says, hey, we need more territory. You had sufficient territory. You didn't drive out the enemy. And that's really the issue uh, that comes down to this. So they forced, they found themselves confined because of the Amorites. We also know that the Philistines later on, as we saw uh, in Samson's life, uh, oppressed them. The cities of Zorah and Eshtel would be two uh, cities in the tribe of Dan. That would be where uh, Manoah was from and Samson was from. Why were these people even there? Seems to me they did not drive out the inhabitants. All of this could have been avoided if they had simply obeyed God and driven out and completely eliminated the inhabitants of the land. We need some land. So they determine that they're going to expand their territory. The phrase at the end of verse 1, Under that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel doesn't mean Joshua did not give them an inheritance. It means they hadn't claimed the land that was theirs. So that leads us then to number 2, and that's the spying of the land. Verse number 2. The children of Dan sent of their family or of their tribe five men from their coasts, their territory. Men of valor, these would be men who obviously would be capable of uh, doing what needed to be done. From Zorah, that's where Manoah was uh, living. From Eshtel, we found Samson in both of these areas, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said unto them, go and search the land. When they came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, they lodged there. We want you to go and, and find the land. We, we need to expand our territory so you guys go find us a place that we can conquer and be able to claim is ours. Well, when they were by the house of Micah, they knew or recognized the voice of the young man, the Levite. <laughs> hey, we know him. It's a small world some days, isn't it? I'm convinced it's getting smaller, all right? But anyway, uh, it is an extremely small world. And so here they are in, in the, near the house of Micah, and they, they recognize this young Levite's voice. And so they turned in thither, and they said to him, Well, who brought thee hither? And what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? Hey, why are you here? <laughs> what are your business dealings here? What is it that has, has brought you to this place? This would, to them, seems to be a very unlikely place to find this young man. And so he said, And thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. Ah, oh, yeah, well, Micah's done all this stuff, and no doubt he explained to it, and he says, He's hired me, he's, he's given me the wages, and, and I'm his priest. Wow priest. Well, that's great. Ask counsel, verse 5, we pray thee of God, that we may know whether our way which we shall go shall be prosperous. And we talked about in our Unlocking the Prophet study, a man by the name of Balak, who is a prophet. <laughs> He's better pictured as a diviner. Um, just because this guy is claiming to be a priest does not mean that he is talking to God. Okay? There's a whole lot of idolatry here, and I, I, if he were a priest as God would have him to be, uh, the idolatry certainly would not be present. Okay? But nonetheless, so it's, it's kind of like, oh, hey, wow. Well, why don't you ask God what, what's going to happen? We want to be sure that our journey is going to be successful. Um want to point out that uh, understanding the nature of what this young man's doing, we can't suggest that he would have received an answer from God regarding this. The means through which you seek God is the means by which God's going to be found. God's not going to be found this way. 
And uh, he would have most likely used the various idols, the ephod, and, and basically function as a diviner. Is this journey going to be successful? I kind of wonder where he got the answer from. I don't know. He said, verse 6, go in peace before the Lord is your way wherein you go. A journey is going to be a prosperous journey and a successful journey. Yahweh, Jehovah, he's going to bless you. A lot of people throw out God's name. A lot of people. Just because that name's thrown out does not mean it's a good thing. Oh, I go to church, well, that's fine. Well, I believe there's a God, yes, so do the devils. And they even tremble. Okay? I mean, there's a lot of religious talk out there that unfortunately suckers in a whole lot of people. Why are the Danites asking about this? Can I say that they did not need to ask, they simply needed to obey? God's given them the victory. God told them that the land was theirs. Why are you asking? All they needed to do was essentially go and claim that which God had already given them. Oftentimes, I find that we are praying about something God's already indicated. The reality is we don't need to continue praying about those kinds of things. What we need to do is claim them as our own and obey what God's already instructed. Amen. They had no need to ask this question. The land was theirs. God's already promised it. Go get it. Okay? We pray about things that we have no business praying about, and we ignore things we have every business praying about. We've got it backwards. Let's be sure that our focus is where it needs to be. Well, so this gives them the encouragement that they need. So the five men, verse 7, departed and came to Laish and saw the people that were therein. How they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure. There was no magistrate in the land that they might put them to shame in anything. And they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. They came here to the city of Laish. It's also known as Leshem in Joshua 19, verse 47. And they discovered that the inhabitants there dwelt careless. It doesn't mean that they were reckless, that they were unwise in how they lived. It suggests they were uh, not experiencing anxiety and care. Uh, they were quite secure. They were dwelling in absolute security. In fact, they didn't have any fears of there being any kind of attack at all says that they dwelt after the manner of the Zidonians or Sidonians, which would be a, a port city much in the northern portion north of Israel, really, uh, in the city of Sidon. Most likely they were uh, somehow uh, related back to them in some way, though the Bible does not teach us uh, that particularly. But this Bible goes on and says they were quiet and secure. They were living in security and they were unsuspecting. We might say they were overconfident. They had lulled themselves into a false sense of security. There was no magistrate in the land suggesting that there was nobody ruling over them and putting them to any sort of tribute or anything like that. They were isolated geographically from the Zidonians or the Sidonians and had no business dealings with man. They were geographically isolated and they basically were their own little place and they were just as confident as they could be. Well, that's exactly what you want if you are an attacking and an invading army. <laughs> you want people who don't suspect that there's going to be a battle. So the spies realized what was taking place. And they came unto their brethren to Zorah and to Eshtel, and their brethren said to them, What say you? Okay, guys, so what, do you, what did you find? And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them. We've seen the land, and behold, it's very good, and are ye still? Be not slothful to go and to enter the, and to possess the land. They get back there, and, and uh, the Danites look at this and say, man, and here they are, they're oppressed by the Amorites. There's nobody overruling over them. We're not going to have any kind of uh, tribute. We're not going to have any nation over top of us. This is what we need to do. say that the, there was a sense of urgency about what it was that uh, they were wanting to do and said, well, we've seen the land, let's go get it. It's, behold, it's very good. Are ye still? Uh, almost like, uh, are you still here? <laughs> let's go. Okay, let's, let's do this and let's conquer this land immediately. Sitting by is simply not going to be an option. Be not slothful to go. 
and to enter to possess the land. It's interesting to me, they came back and they said, wow, this land is great, it's perfect. You know, the city of Laish offered them exactly what they needed. They needed the security, they needed all of that, but it's also interesting to note that they observed what God had already said about the land. What did God say about the promised land? Hey, you guys are going to have everything you need. You're going to have wells that have been dug that you didn't have to dig. You're going to have houses built you didn't have to build. Vineyards planted you didn't plant. You're going to walk in and it's going to be everything you need. So the people come back and they say, wow, this land's everything we need. Really? News flash. What a shock. It was what God said it would be. And that was what they discovered. There's a whole lot easier way of going about this than the way they went. So that leads us then to the conquest of Laish. We, there went out, the Bible says. I'm sorry, let me read verse 10. I skip that. When you go, you shall come into a people secure, into a large land. For God hath given it into your hands, a place where there's no want of anything that's in the earth. Exactly what God said about this land. Guys, let's go get it. So they went out from thence of the family of the Danites, of the tribe of the Danites, of the tribe of Dan, out of Zor and out of Eshel, 600 men appointed with weapons of war. That's not a very large army. 600 armed men, uh, we presume capably armed men, uh, but they're not anticipating a huge battle. Even the spies, when they were conquering the promised land and they came to the city of Ai, said, ah, we don't need to send but about 3,000 there. And of course, they were beaten because of Achan's sin. Uh, but uh, 600 is, is not that many. So obviously, they, they were not expecting much of a battle. And so the Bible says that they went up and pitched in kerjath Jerem, which is in Judah. This would be to the east of where they're going. Wherefore, they called the place uh, Mahanadan, and that is simply saying the camp of Dan. That's how it became known, located behind kerjath Jerem. In other words, it's, it's before you get there, there was this territory that became known as the camp of Dan. And they passed thence unto Mount Ephraim and came unto the house of Micah. That leads us to the raid on Micah. <laughs> Then answered the five men that went to spy out the country of Laish and said unto their brethren, Do you know that there is in these houses an ephod and teraphim and a graven image and a molten image? Now therefore consider what ye have to do. Hey uh, guys, while we were spying out this land, did you know that there's this, these images, the ephod and, and uh, I mean we, we've got all of these things. Now consider uh, what ye have to do, and, and the idea behind this is that uh, you guys need to, to go ahead and think about this, and, and let's go ahead and, and uh, let's get these things. Now, why did they go into the house to steal these things? And that's exactly what they end up doing. Did they just feel like looting? <laughs> It's a messed up society, isn't it, that we live in when a football team wins a Super Bowl and so we burn buildings and steal? <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Hey, wow, we won. Let's destroy. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, but that's, it's not that they're just wanting to steal. To them, if they get these things, it's their good luck charm. This is going to give us success to battle. We, we need to go get this stuff here. We'll have God on our side. This is the equivalent. If we can take these idols, this is like saying, you know, God's right here. Is God there? No, not at all. That's how they viewed it. We'll get a definite victory. And again, it further illustrates the spiritual decline of Israel. So the Bible says that Verse 11, or 15, rather, they turned thitherward and came to the house of the young man, the Levite. He went unto the house of Micah and saluted him, and they greeted him. So these five men turn in, and, and they greet this young man and say, Hey, how are you? Yeah, it's great to see you again. I'm sure, yeah, blah, blah, blah. The 600 men appointed with their weapons of war 
which were of the children of Dan, stood by the entering of the gate. They prevented anybody else from coming in. And the five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither and took the graven image, Zephod, the teraphim, and the molten image. <laughs> five men, five things. They walk in, hey, you grab this, grab that, grab that, grab this, and off we go. And the priest says, what are you doing? <laughs> what do ye? Okay, uh, we don't necessarily read it quite that way, but the Bible says, I guess I need to finish verse 17. I'm going to get ahead of myself. The priest stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed of the weapons of war, and these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod, the teraphim, the molten image. Then said the priest, what do you do? What do you? Hey, what are you doing? You can't take those. Well, what is he going to do? <laughs> okay. You know, I had 600 people. Well, okay. I can't. Watch me. Okay. So the they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth. <laughs> Be quiet. It's very simple. And go with us. Be to us a father and a priest. Hey, is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man? Or shalt thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel? What are you doing? Well, we're actually getting ready to steal this stuff. Oh, okay. Be quiet. <laughs> yes, sir, I'll be quiet. Why don't you come with us? Right now, you're just a priest to one man in his house. I got a better offer for you. You come be a priest to an entire tribe. Wow. This must be from God. We need to be careful. Remember Jesus was tempted. Hey, if you go ahead and bow down now, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. You can have them now. So no, I'll have all those later. Okay? Well, sometimes we get lured by the possibilities of whatever. We need to be very careful that, that we are certain that God's in these things. And so the Bible says, verse 20, the priest's heart was glad and he took the ephod and the teraphim, the graven image, and went in the midst of the people. Oh, wow, okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, I'll just join right with you guys, right in the middle of them. So they turned and departed. And put the little ones and the cattle and the carriage before them. They anticipated there would be Somebody who's not going to be too happy. A man by the name of Micah. So let's go ahead and put some of the armed guard, if not all of the armed guard, uh, in the rear. And we'll put the children and the cattle and the carriage, all of our possessions, up in, the, in front of them. So that anticipating there's an attack from the rear, we'll just simply deal with that. And everyone else, and including our property, will be safe. And so the Bible says, when they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house, these would be his neighbors, were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. They saw what was going on, and so they all got together, and they were probably uh, able to, to be influenced positively by Micah's and Micah's presence in the priest and all that. So they all got together, and they, they overtook the children of Dan. They caught up with them in their journey. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth thee that thou comest with such a company? So here comes the neighbors, and they all begin uh, crying out to the Micah, and, or, or rather to the, the Israelites, and the tribe of Dan. And well, the tribe of Dan turns around and says to Micah, What do you want, having gathered all of these people together? And I'm thinking to myself, well, of course, what, he wants his stuff. He wants his priest back. Uh, what do you want? Why, why are you here with all these people? Well, he says, because, verse 24, ye have taken away my gods, which I made, and the priests, when are, ye are gone away. And what have I more? What is this that ye say unto me? What aileth thee? This is kind of a comical section. We'll give the Q interpretation to this. You took my stuff and you're asking me what my problem is? 
You just stole my house. You stole everything that I've made. You, you're wondering what, what my problem is. Really? I can tell you what my problem is. You just stole this stuff. It's like somebody steals your car and you catch them. Why are you upset? Are you kidding me? Let me tell you why I'm upset. You just stole from me. Children today, and said unto him, Let not thy voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon thee. <laughs> and thou lose thy life with the lives of thy household. Micah, be quiet. Okay, stop yelling. Because it may very well be that the wrong people hear. So evidently, maybe some of the armed guard was a little bit further ahead and there were some people in the back. Maybe it was the calm, cool, and collected people in the back. And they knew that the guys with the short temper that were just looking to kill somebody were just a little bit further ahead. Micah, be quiet. Because if you keep yelling like you're yelling, there are going to be some people who want to kill you. And you will be dead. And your household will be dead. So be quiet. <laughs> and the children of Dan went their way, verse 26. And when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back unto his house. That's kind of a comical thing. Flip side of that, it's quite a sad thing. Because this is the decline of the nation of Israel. We've rejected God. We've just established all of these other gods. We need them to go to battle for us so that we can win. So we'll just steal from this guy. And when he has a problem with it, we'll just tell him to be quiet. If he doesn't be quiet, we'll kill him. It's really very simple. This is God's people. It doesn't seem to fit, does it? Doesn't it seem to be pretty inconsistent with what they're supposed to be and what they actually are? So they continue on their journey. Well, that leads us to the conquest of Laish. Verse number 27, they took the things which Micah had made and the priests which he had and came into Laish unto a people that were at quiet and secure. Again, they were unsuspecting that anything would take place. And they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. Well, there was no problem here. They had a very easy victory. There was no deliverer because it was far from Zidon or Sidon, which it is. It's a long way away. Uh, this is much further south. And they had no business with any man. They had no... Uh, alliances, no ties with anybody. They were just their own isolated little village. And it was in the valley that lieth by Beth Rehob, and, and they built a city and dwelt there. And so they came there, and they killed all the inhabitants, and burned the city down, and rebuilt their own city. Now, verse 29 leads us to the idolatry in Dan. Notice they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, their father. Dan was one of Jacob's sons. He was born to, uh, by means of Rachel's handmaid, Bilhah. You can read about that in Genesis. Um, I believe it's chapter 20-something. Anyway, I don't have the reference here. But anyway, it was uh, through Rachel's handmaid that Dan comes. Howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the children of Dan set up the graven image Jonathan, the son of Gershon, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests of the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. There are some questions as to exactly what is meant by the phrase until the day of the captivity of the land. Some suggest this is the Assyrian captivity. It's probably a captivity that we're not told about in the Word of God. But they set up Micah's graven image and they began to worship in the city of Dan. It's interesting that it's now Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. He and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan. Well, what happened to the other guy? I wonder if that business venture didn't work out quite so well for him. We don't know. Maybe that's his name. I don't think so, but it's possible. But what I want you to see is they set them up, Micah's graven image, which he had made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Joshua had commanded the tabernacle to be set up there in Shiloh, Joshua 18 and verse number 1. 
And here we find this is where the idols set up, just a little bit south. Throughout the Word of God, you'll find the expression, especially in Kings and the Chronicles, from Dan even to Beersheba. Dan is located in southern Judah, would represent southern Israel. Beersheba is located about as far north in Israel as you can go. From the south to the north would be the equivalent of that expression. Whole land of Israel. But it becomes very clear that the Israelites chose to reject God. They chose to follow another God. Even though just a few miles away, the tabernacle was there. With everything going on. Israel had declined spiritually to the point that they no longer acknowledged the God of Israel. But instead chose to follow the land, the idols of the land in which they lived. Let me say that a little bit differently because for us that's like, okay, that's great. Let's say it this way, instead of following God... They chose to adopt the culture that they were surrounded by. That's what I see the problem with Christians in America. Rather than standing out as God would have us to stand out, we are far too quick to adopt the culture in which we live. And that becomes the norm. We can look at the idea of grabbing a, an idol and carrying it into battle and saying, oh, wow, this means I'm going to be successful. We can say, oh, yeah, that's kind of stupid. Put an idol on your dashboard, your car, and it means your car won't break down. Yeah, that won't happen. Okay? But can I point out that oftentimes we take our job and think that's the key to our success? Now, to be sure that God does use the job to meet your needs, but God's not bound by that. We've watched him do that in our own personal lives. You have perhaps as well. Times when work was slow, God still took care of you. I'm not saying that it's wrong to work, but when you view that job as the key to your success, that job has become an idol. Very simple. Because it's taken the place of God. We would say then that it is equally idolatrous. It is therefore equally wrong. And is it not even fair to say that it is equally foolish? These things were written for our learning. Let's turn in closing to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's a passage I referenced this morning, or this, uh, earlier on today. This kind of idolatry absolutely cannot be tolerated into our lives. It's one thing for us to read this story and in some ways laugh at some of the things that take place. I want you to notice 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. I was not planning on going here, so I don't have it on a slide. Verse number 1 of... Chapter 10, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. Paul wants his believers to be knowledgeable. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. It does not mean the church was in the Old Testament. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Did all drink the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Was there any Israelites who were not delivered from Egypt? No. They all experienced it. They all experienced the, the wonders of crossing the Red Sea. Man, what an amazing time. They all experienced leaving Egypt. They all experienced getting the water out of the rock. They all experienced the manna. But with many of them, verse 5, God was not well pleased. They all experienced it, but the majority of them God was not happy with. Look at the common things that we have experienced. Is God happy with you? Is He pleased with what you're doing? They were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our example to the intent. We should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as some of them were. 
As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Are the lessons in Judges 18 applicable to us today? Absolutely. And we live in a culture that says, me first. And whatever makes you happy, go for it. Well, sometimes what makes you happy may make God very unhappy. I would encourage you not to go for it. To instead align yourself with what God desires. Amen. Approve those things that God approves of and reject those things that God disapproves of. Is God first in your life? It's a yes or no question. And I'll say this, it's very easy for things to not, to not have the right balance. So, oh yeah, yeah, God's first in my life. Okay, well that's good. How much time did you spend with him last week? Well, it's a pretty busy week. Well, then God's not first. Well, but you don't understand the week I had. That's probably true. Or does it matter? My understanding of it does not change anything. This is the reality. God expects for us to seek him above all else. Amen. Let's be diligent in doing so. Let's commit to doing so and give God the first place. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed.